Welcome back to Prescott Talks. Uh, this is our interview with uh, Brian Mache, candidate for governor, and this is actually part two. And so, Brian, why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, what it is that distinguishes you from the other qualified candidates in this race? Sure, Jim. That's a great question because there are a lot of great candidates in the race, uh, some well-qualified people. Uh, I think the biggest thing that people need to understand is um, the fact that we are in a war. And because we are actually in a war right now, we need a wartime governor. We need a war fighter. We need someone that will literally step in between the federal government, the state government, and the people. The other people that are in the race, there aren't any veterans. There aren't any former police officers. There are no other healthcare providers. None of those other four candidates have been down at the Capitol in the last two years fighting for all of your rights, your children and your grandchildren's rights. I've been there in the middle of it. Um, you know, one of the candidates doesn't have really much experience outside of reading news. Another one on the other end has spent 30 years in Congress. Uh, another one has a father who was on the Arizona Corporation Commission and a brother on the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. These are all people that are well connected within the state, meaning there's a good side and a bad side to that. The bad side, they owe people favors. I owe no one any favors. I, I, I'm not uh, don't have any long term relationships with any of the uh, you know financial donors in the state. Uh, I'm basically unencumbered and can really do my job as the people's servant. Like that's what, you know, my motto is. I, I'm not here to do Brian's will. I'm here to protect the rights of the people of Arizona. And no other candidate in the race knows the Constitution as well as I do, the state and the U.S. Constitution. No one has an actual plan written down that they've said, hold me accountable to what I'm saying and to what I'm going to do. Um, like I said, they are good people, but the situation that we're in now, desperate times calls for desperate measures. And when that happens, we have to look outside of where we normally would have went to look for that person that's gonna be able to protect us. Kind of like with President Trump, when he ran for office, he was the outsider. You'd kind of be in that same category. Absolutely. So how do you anticipate being able to work with the state legislature once you're governor? Sure. So I, you know, I do have some friends in the legislature. Um, and for me, it, it's all about building coalition and building consensus. Okay. Uh, and, you know, my philosophy of leadership, I learned in the military. It's leading from the front always. So when it comes to tackling some of these problems, I need to be out front of them. The last place that you're going to find uh, a governor, Brian Mache, would be on the ninth floor of the Capitol. I'm going to be in the hospitals talking to the uh, to the doctors, talking to the nurses, talking to the housekeeping staff. You know, I'm going to be at the border. Literally, I am going to move the, the ninth floor Capitol to the southern border. And I'm not kidding about this. There is no reason that I can't, you know, do the people's business from the border. Mm -hmm. And I'll be there to oversee all of it and to make sure that this gets done, because this is the one most important, most crucial thing that has to be done. No other candidate understands that. They don't have the mindset that we are in a war and we need someone to be our war fighter for us. So you're looking at uh, getting involved, taking action immediately to start resolving some of these problems. Well, one other area I wanted to ask you about, uh, a lot of these organizations that are out there that are funded by taxpayer money. Sure. Um, I, I, for one, have always wondered if there is enough accountability. How would you go about making these uh, organizations that are receiving taxpayer money financially accountable uh, so that they're not wasting our money with high, ex high executive salaries. Absolutely. Like yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question because there is a lot of that that goes on. And I think erring on the most severe side of transparency is the best way to go. These uh, different organizations that receive taxpayer funding, all of their books should be wide open and available. And not a matter of having to go file some paperwork and, oh, let me see your, uh, you know, 403B paper or 501K or whatever. Like, all of their stuff should be printed and should be online, available for everyone to see, whether that's through a site uh, from the state or through their own site. We need to have transparency because there is a lot of fraud, waste and abuse that goes on. 
Um, when I was an MBA student, I learned about the Pareto principle, which is, you know, 80% of your revenue comes from, you know, 20% of your customers or 80% of the work is done from 20% of the people. So there's a huge sums of money there in all these different organizations that can be cut out. And then we can say, you know what, you need to be more accountable to this. You need to be transparent. The voters and the people of Arizona need to see where their money is going. Mm. So what is uh, your position on the state income tax? Do you have any thoughts on that? I frankly don't think there's any reason we should even have a state income tax. Um, some people may disagree with me on this, but uh, I've told this to several people. I don't see any reason why we don't have 100% legalized gambling in the state of Arizona, mm -hmm. not just on Indian reservations, but everywhere. Essentially, there's no difference between us and Las Vegas, Nevada, and the amount of revenue that that could generate and bring back into the state. There's already a coalition of uh, House members and Senate members that want that. And it would just be a matter of building a larger group of people to get behind something like that. Because there's no reason that we shouldn't be attracting all of those trade shows and all of those business commitments. Why couldn't Scottsdale be just the same as Las Vegas? Ultimately, there's no reason that it shouldn't. So you're thinking of bringing in alternate sources of revenue? Absolutely. Uh, rather than always dipping into the taxpayer's pockets? Absolutely. Well, that's a good idea. Government think, should yeah. try to become self-sustaining on its own, Jim. Well, we look at also uh, government, uh, federal government overreach. And I know in, in my viewpoint, uh, the states have been too willing to sell their 10th Amendment, if you will, sure. rights uh, for some type of uh, money. You know, right. so the federal government offers them a tidbit. You know, if you let us do this, we'll give you this. And then they relinquish control. Sure. And so, you know, what would you do to try to you know stem some of that? Yeah, that, that's a great uh, topic because, you know, it's kind of similar to what they did with the driver's license when they said, you know, all of a sudden the, the legalized drinking age has to be 21 and not 18. Well, you're not going to get taxpayer funded uh, highways if you don't do this, you know, at the state level. So it's very simple. The 10th Amendment, you mentioned it. It literally states, literally, uh, you know, that those things not laid out within the Constitution right here are left to the states to decide for themselves. So we need to have legislators that are in office that are literally realizing it, it's not our job to be trading with the federal government in order to get you know money back to the state and in, in order to do uh, the federal government's bidding because that's what they're doing. They're literally buying people. And we need legislators that are willing to not do that, not be involved in that. I think part of that comes with the leadership at the governor's office and saying, I'm ending the state of emergency and we're not taking any more of this federal money. Uh, there's no reason to send this money to the state uh, related to COVID because it wasn't necessary. Um, so I think, you know, getting out front of those problems and, um, you know, showing real leadership on them will help inspire, you know, a lot of the legislature to come alongside of me and say, yeah, we don't want to vote for that. We don't want to participate in that. All right. And uh, if you uh, considered uh, the um, what they call nullification, when states work together sure. to stop the federal government's overreach, uh, you thought about how you would work together with other governors to get something like that done? Yeah, absolutely. I think nullification is one of the most uh, important parts of our constitution. Um, you know, Article Five, you know, speaks to like the convention of states, and I don't know that going and amending the U.S. Constitution is. Uh, in order to get certain things done is the right way to go. Because when we start uh, pulling apart at the Constitution and pulling on strings, it allows for the whole thing to unravel. And, you know, something very different than that would, would be then, like you're saying, you know, working with other governors, working with other state legislatures and saying, no, instead we're going to nullify this. And we're going to take an alternate approach to stopping some of this federal overreach. I think that's the best way to do it. Okay. And do you think you're going to be able to get the legislature to go along with that just uh, basically on your leadership? And you're going to be, you know, you're going to have some opposition, I would think. Sure, absolutely. You know, opposition is going to be there um, regardless of whatever candidate it is in the race. Mm -hmm. You know, whichever candidate wins the governor's seat, there's going to be opposition. But I think I've shown in my past with, um, you know, my ability to lead troops into battle. Uh, my ability to, um, you know, lead entire surgical floors uh, and trauma floors in the biggest hospitals in the state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've done these sort of things and showed that those leadership qualities uh, in the past where, you know, leaders, you know, they make 
big decisions and they say, we're going to go and we're going to take that mountain. And we not, may not know the exact way that we're going to do it yet. And we may not have the mechanism of the why of how we're going to do it, but we know why we need to do it and we're going to go do it. Mm -hmm. I like to think of, um, you know, JFK in that moment when he said, you know, we don't go to the moon because it is easy. Mm -hmm. We go to the moon because it is hard. You know, when you put yourself out there and you inspire others to come up to that level, then, you know, I, I think that's the way to lead. And I've done that, you know, my entire life. So let me ask you this. Now, I've been involved in Republican politics for quite some time now, and it seems like there's a tendency for them to resist uh, conservative constitutional candidates like yourself uh, and almost kind of work against you. Are you experiencing any of that? Um, yeah, absolutely. I've uh, I had one candidate, one of the leading candidates in the, in the race that uh, literally went to the LD15 chair and said, uh, if you invite Brian Mache to this governor's panel, because I was invited, I was on the flyer and everything, uh, she said she will not attend. And, you know, I've experienced that. Um, I was supposed to be allowed to speak at the pre at President Trump's rally uh, last summer. Uh, it was for any declared candidates that had registered uh, and had an active campaign running. And, um, you know, people within the party literally worked to keep me off that stage mm -hmm. because they knew that if a real constitutional conservative stood up in front of 10,000 people in that arena, it would have brought the house down. Mm -hmm. So go get him, keep him off to the side because he's dangerous to what our plans are. They did the same thing to me at the Ainsworth. Uh, there was a governor's uh, panel and a secretary of state panel. And they said they were canceling the governor's panel two days beforehand. I went down there anyway to gather signatures and meet the voters. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the two leading candidates in the race wind up being on stage one after another. One of my friends was there, called me and said, Brian, you need to get down here right away. And I got three minutes at the very end uh, of the panel. And, and I did a great job with the three minutes that I had. But this stuff happens within the Republican Party. There is a cancer in our party and the cancer needs to be cut out because when we do this and we pick and choose who the available candidates are, we're usurping the Republic right there because we're denying the voters the choices to see what's really available. And who knows, maybe the number one candidate in the race winds up taking an idea from the very last person in the race, you know, and, and they run with it because that's a great idea and it gets put to use somehow. Um, it only does a disservice to the voters and to the Republican Party when we play any of these games with picking and choosing candidates. Right, because it's actually supposed to be the voters that are electing the representation. It's not supposed to be decided at the top. Right. So we got a couple minutes left. Uh, is there sure. anything else that you would just like the, the voters and the people that are listening to know sure. about you and your candidacy? And why don't you go ahead and sure. talk to them? So there's a few other things. Um, I've talked about some of my plans with regards to the invasion of the southern border. That's number one. Um, election integrity is huge. I, I was involved in getting hundreds of affidavits signed um, that actually authorized the audit here in Arizona. And if the bill comes across my desk, like HB 2596, I'll sign it on day one, where it literally says one day, one vote on paper, no machines. When it comes to the school systems, there'll be no CRT, no SEL. We will literally have no vaccine mandates, no mask mandates. If they try to quarantine our kids, these things are felonies. People will lose their job. They will lose their pension. They'll lose their teaching certificate and they won't be allowed to be a teacher in the state of Arizona. Again, we need to hit back because the left for years has been hitting over and over again. And no one has had the courage to stand up to what is happening and to do what's necessary. The final big thing that I really want the voters to know about is this. Um, a little sidebar that people will find out about me. I have the only set of sex templates ever born in the state of Arizona. <laughs> so I have six kids, three boys, three girls. They're all 14 years old. They are 100% healthy. They were born at 30 weeks and five days. Yeah. When we did our fertility procedure, the doctors at the time wanted us to actually abort three of those babies, okay? Mm -hmm. And 
there was no way. I, I wasn't a nurse then. I didn't know. My wife uh, was a PA. She knew. And I want to tell the people of Arizona right now, and I want this to be as clear as possible. On day one, if the bill is already written and sitting on my desk, I will pass an Arizona heartbeat bill. The same as Texas, but we'll go even further. Well, we will make sure that a woman sees an ultrasound every four weeks, three times. Uh, the statistics have shown us over and over again that when a woman sees a heartbeat of her child, 80% of the time that actually goes uh, down that they go through with uh, terminating a pregnancy. So I will sign that as well on day one. And, you know, this is about our children. You know, this isn't about me. This isn't about, um, you know, those of us that have already been around uh, for years. This is about the next generation. And is the next generation going to grow up in the free state of Arizona that the rest of us grew up in? Are we actually going to be turning freedom over to the next generation? Because President Reagan said it. He said it's not free. He said it's fought for and freedom is preserved and is passed from one person to the other, not in the bloodstream, but through strife. And if we lose freedom here, there's no place to retreat to. And one day we will wake up telling our children and grandchildren about what it was like to live in Arizona. That's not gonna happen if I'm the governor of Arizona. That will never happen. Well, thank you very much. I'm Thanks sure too. that was very informative. Uh, that about wraps it up for us tonight. And uh, we thank you for listening. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm quite stirred. <laughs> thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.